This program is produced by listener-supported KFUO Radio. Your support during KFUO share is vital to the continuation of great programs like this one. If you appreciate this program, please consider what you can give to support the ongoing ministry of KFUO Radio and this program. You can make a gift sending a text to the number 41444. Enter KFUO as the message. You'll get a text right back that walks you through the steps on your phone, and it takes just a minute or two. You can also visit KFUO.org and click on the Donate button or give Mary a call at 314-996-1518. Thanks for listening and supporting KFUO Radio. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Listener-supported KFUO celebrates share 2022 this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Hope you can join us. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. We have a church commemoration to share with you today. Uh, it is April 20th. The church commemorates Johannes Bugenhagen, who is Johannes Bugenhagen. Joining us today, Dr. Cameron McKenzie, Professor of Historical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dr. McKenzie, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm glad to be with you. Who is Johannes Bugenhagen? Uh, Johannes Bugenhagen was Martin Luther's pastor. And in addition to that, he was Martin Luther's colleague at uh, the University of uh, Wittenberg teaching theology. And in addition to that, he helped to uh, organize the Reformation in lots of different places outside of Wittenberg, uh, especially in the uh, northern part of what is today Germany uh, and uh, in Denmark. So he's one of those fellows who is kind of beneath the uh, big names of the Reformation, like Melanchthon, Luther, and Calvin, and so forth, uh, but really one of those fellows who actually implemented the Reformation, um, made it possible, uh, institutionalized the Lutheran Church uh, without Bugenhagen. Who knows what the Reformation would have amounted to? He was a very important figure at the time. Yeah, the more I, the more I learn about him, uh, the more just awesome his story is because of all of that work that he did, really boots on the ground uh, work to to spread the Reformation, to implement it. Like you said, we have uh, a lot to talk about with his life and his uh, his relationship with Martin Luther. So let's start, let's start at the beginning. Uh, what do we know about his early life, his upbringing, his education, those kind of details? Sure. Uh, actually, in terms of his later work, uh, his early life becomes very important. Uh, particularly because of the part of uh, the German territories that he was from. He was from uh, the territory known as Pomerania. And that is a part of uh, Germany that's on the southern coast of the Baltic Sea. Uh, you know, if you go west from there, you're going to hit Denmark. If you go north, you're going to hit Sweden on the other side of the Baltic. Uh, if you would uh, go to the east, uh, actually Pomerania stretched into what today is a part of Poland. So it's it, it's that that part of uh, Germany. Uh, he was born in a, a little city called Volen. His father was something of a uh, important locally, and that meant that he could provide for a good education for his uh, his son. And so he got that good education and ended up going to the University of Greifswald, which is also up there in uh, Pomer- Pomerania. Um, like a lot of uh, young intellectuals at that time, uh, Bugenhagen uh, fell in love with uh, the kind of the dominant intellectual uh, currency of the era, something we call humanism. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sorry that we use that term because it can be a little confusing. It's not related at all to what we think of as humanism today. It was simply a movement in intellectual circles uh, back to the classics, the classics of um, Greece and Rome, uh, Latin literature, you know, people like Cicero and so forth. Uh, and uh, among the humanists of the era uh, are people like Bugenhagen, but also Melanchthon and John Calvin. So it was a kind of a very important movement uh, among intellectuals that in many ways helped to prepare them for the Reformation. So tell me more about his education that and uh, that led up to him being a pastor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
his his education at the university would have been standard medieval stuff. But in addition to that, uh, he got interested in the classics. And among those intellectuals who were uh, writing and promoting that same uh, current of thought uh, was Desiderius Erasmus, very big name, probably the biggest humanist of the era. Uh, and Erasmus encouraged young intellectuals interested in antiquity to expand their horizons to Christian antiquity. Think of the New Testament and the early church fathers who come out of that same classical period in history, but do so as Christians. And that's really what uh, Bugenhagen um, became involved in, not, not uh, studying under Erasmus, but reading Erasmus's materials. And so uh, after he uh, was ordained a priest and took a post as a teacher, uh, he began more and more to think about, well, what is, how does the Bible describe the Christian religion? How does that compare with what we're doing in church and society? And gradually came to the conviction that uh, the church needed uh, reform. And then Erasmus also, the church needed reform. It had to go back to the Bible. Um, and then when Luther starts publishing, people like Erasmus and Bugenhagen start reading Luther's stuff because he's saying the same thing. We've got to go back to the Bible. We have to reform the church. But unlike Erasmus, Luther realized that what was wrong in the church was not just, you know, the way they worshiped, superstition, this kind of stuff, but actually what they taught about man's relationship to God. And so Bugenhagen uh, ended up embracing the Lutheran Reformation uh, as opposed to just the Erasmian Reformation. But it was really those studies that he himself made of the Bible on the basis of uh, uh, influenced by Erasmus that helped move him toward Reformation in the first place. That's very interesting. What was his relationship like with uh, with Martin Luther's writing? What was what were those first encounters like? Was he did he embrace it right away, or did it take him a little time? Yeah, no, it it, it took him a little time. Uh, the The general pattern was Luther's initial opposition to indulgences and the kind of moral and financial corruptions of the papacy uh, were widely embraced by reformers of all sorts. But then when Luther started tackling doctrine, uh, especially in 1520, when he published his treatise on the sacramental system of the medieval church, his Babylonian captivity, wow, that was, that was way too much. And so Bugenhagen um, reaction was negative. But he didn't quit studying. He didn't keep, quit reading. And as a matter of fact, he corresponded with Luther, and Luther sent him... Uh, his tract on the freedom of a Christian. And this work is just an eloquent expression of what Christianity basically is. And Luther boils it down to faith in Christ, which determines our relationship with God, Christ the Savior having done it all for us. And then the second principle is love, what we do with our lives in service to God and service to our neighbor. Uh, and so Bugenhagen was very much impressed by that and so he finally decided that he was going to go to Wittenberg uh, to study uh, Luther and Lutheran theology for himself, you know, to see how much sense it really made. So he arrived just at the time that uh, Luther was taking off for the uh, Diet of Worms. So instead of studying with Luther initially, he ended up studying with uh, Melanchthon. Um, but already by that time, Bugenhagen had an expertise in the Bible. And he actually not only studied, but he actually started lecturing on the book of Psalms and started to make his mark in Wittenberg uh, as a uh, up and coming uh, theologian. Uh, and it was from there then that he began, his career began to take off. So in 1521, he actually comes to Wittenberg and starts uh, studying, but also uh, doing some teaching there. So tell us more about his time in Wittenberg. Well, uh, a few years after he uh, had arrived and was starting to make his mark uh, already as a biblical interpreter, uh, the uh, pastorate at uh, the Wittenberg City Church fell vacant. Uh, the old pastor died. 
And so they had to look around for a new one. And the various names were suggested. Uh, but Luther thought that Buchenhagen uh, was the man for the job. Uh, and so he persuaded the uh, town council uh, to offer the post to uh, Buchenhagen. And Buchenhagen accepted it, became the parish pastor of Wittenberg in 1523 and held the post until his death in 1558. So 35 years as pastor of Wittenberg. Now that involved him, of course, in doing pastoral stuff, uh, preaching, mm -hmm. hearing confessions, marrying, burying, and he spent a lot of his life doing those things, including doing those things for Martin Luther and his family. So as mm -hmm. pastor, he, um, married uh, Luther and uh, Catherine von Bora. Uh, he uh, heard Luther's uh, confessions of sins. Uh, he, he preached. Uh, and then when Luther died, uh, it was Bugenhagen who preached uh, Luther's uh, funeral sermon. So he was intimately connected as a pastor, as well as a friend and as a colleague, but as a pastor with Luther and his uh, family. What was that relationship like between the two of them? What kind of influence would they have had on each other during this during this time of, of all of this change that's happening around them uh, that they were very intimately involved with? What would that relationship have been like between the two of them? Well, they are friends and they are colleagues. Uh, they work together in addition to Bugenhagen's pastoral relationship with uh, Luther. Uh, and so on projects like uh, translating the Bible into German. Uh, Bugenhagen would have been a participant in those discussions. Uh, when issues arose, uh, attacking parts of uh, Luther's theology, uh, Bugenhagen was active in defending Reformation theology. Uh, a real good example of that are, uh, is the dispute that arose with uh, Ulrich Swingley from um, Zurich over the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. Uh, Bugenhagen was actually the first of the Wittenberg theologians uh, to write in defense of uh, the real presence of the body and blood of Jesus uh, against Swingley, who was saying, no, no, the bread and wine were only symbols of the body and blood. So Bugenhagen was a part of the team that was shaping, uh, promoting, defending, uh, Lutheran theology. Luther is the main man, but somebody like Buchenhagen is right there at his side and supportive of him. Um, and then Buchenhagen gets his own opportunities uh, to teach, uh, to preach, and as we said at the outset, uh, actually go to other places to help uh, establish uh, the reform. So the two men were friends uh, and colleagues, uh, influenced each other, uh, worked together very closely. Um, as, as I'm talking here, let me just mention one other thing that uh, people might find interesting, and that is uh, on the Bible translation. Um, Bugenhagen's from northern Germany, where the uh, prevailing German dialect is something we call Low German. Uh, so he knew Low German, and so he made it a big part of his work to put Luther's German translation of the Bible in, which is in high German, to put that into low German so it could be published in a form that would make it um, readable uh, by the people of uh, Germany from which Bugenhagen had come in the first place. So that would be a way in which he would supplement uh, the work that Luther was otherwise doing. Today we're learning about Johannes Bugenhagen, pastor to Luther, uh, as the church commemorates him on April 20th. Our guest today, Dr. Cameron McKenzie, professor of historical theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We have more to learn in this yes. great history lesson today. Love we'll continue it. the conversation in just a moment right here on The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. 
Whether you're taking one of 50 plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Today is April 20th, the day that the church commemorates Johannes Bugenhagen, a pastor to Luther and also professor. Um, our guest today is Dr. Cameron McKenzie, professor of historical theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So we've learned about um, Johannes Bugenhagen, a, a little bit of his history and his his early life, his education relationship to Luther Tell us more about his contribution to the Reformation. We, we've talked about his relationship to Luther. Did he have any other contribution outside of his relationship to Luther, to the Reformation? Yeah, he, he sure did. Um, he was really instrumental in uh, organizing uh, the Lutheran Church. Uh, you know, it's one thing to preach and teach. It's quite another thing. Uh, to set up institutions that will maintain that preaching and teaching uh, over the long term. Um, now, he had these contacts in other places on account of his own background. And in connection with the Reformation, he uh, was invited uh, to, uh, well, first of all, go to these other places. And when he couldn't go to these other places, uh, then to um, write to them about how they should uh, develop their uh, their church institutions. I mean, part of this was because Buchenhagen had been involved with some of the early efforts at organizing the Lutheran Church in Saxony and had participated, and so he had some experience, but also because he was a pastor as well as part of the Wittenberg theological team. Uh, so he um, traveled very widely to introduce the Reformation and organize Lutheran churches. Uh, as early as 1528-29, he was in Braunschweig. And then in 1530, he was in Lübeck. And then a few years after that, he spent a couple of years in Pomerania. And then a few years after that, he spent a couple more years in Denmark. And in those places, he was really given responsibility for implementing Reformation. The decision to become a Reformation or Lutheran church had been made by the time he got there, but not much had really been done practically. So he had to give attention to things like, well, how are we going to organize churches, or I should say rather organize the ministry and make sure that the churches have qualified pastors who can preach and teach. He was also concerned with the future and therefore with the establishment of schools and how are they going to be funded and what kind of curriculum would be placed in those schools. Uh, and then also uh, concern for Christian charity. Um, and that is, how was the church going to take care of the uh, poor, uh, the widowed, uh, the disabled uh, in their various communities. And so all of these things, as well as how they were going to worship in their churches, were a part of the things that Bugenhagen had to work out with the local church in a way that could give permanence to the Reformation in those places. And that meant, lots of times it meant bringing people together who were already kind of mad about stuff or finding out what the local customs were and evaluating whether those local customs were consistent with the Bible or whether they had to be removed or changed or something like that. It also meant um, dealing with uh, the authorities uh, because they would have their own ideas. And sometimes Buchenhagen would have to gently, you know, explain that those ideas weren't <laughs> quite, quite right. Um, in Denmark, uh, one of the first things that he did was actually uh, to participate in the coronation of the new king and the new queen. And he actually crowned the king and queen. Uh, also in Denmark, he ended up uh, consecrating bishops who would then be responsible for uh, maintaining the church that he had helped to uh, set up. Uh, so 
he was just very much involved in the practical implication of uh, Reformation principles uh, in these churches, ones that he visited, where he spent time personally, and then also in addition to that, uh, writing up um, what are called the church orders for other places where it would just be the kind of um, description of what it is that the local authorities needed to do in order to implement uh, Reformation. So the shape of um, Lutheranism, especially in this northern part of uh, Germany and then in Denmark, just owes an awful lot to uh, Buchenhagen. Yeah, he is. He's so influential in all of those things. I imagine his, I, I'm trying to imagine what his personality must have been like in order to to really implement all of those things and to be able to bring people together and create order during this time. He must have been really a, a, a wonderful person, I I would think. What was his relationship like with um, with the people, the other, the other reformers of the day? Uh, did he have influence with uh, some of the other reformers? I know obviously mm-hmm. Luther, but, but what about other other reformers of the day. Sure. Um, since you mentioned what kind of person it is, I'm going to tell you one little anecdote that doesn't quite answer your question, but uh, oh, that's right. <laughs> people might appreciate it, and I probably should have mentioned yes. it before. Um, as a pastor, he's a very faithful pastor, but he did have a reputation for uh, preaching um, long sermons. <laughs> on, on one occasion, Luther said of him, he was like a, a barrel of wine and you pulled the stopper out and it didn't stop leaking until it, every last bit had come out. Um, and on another <laughs> another occasion, uh, Luther uh, told of a, um, uh, a person, a man who had a, attended services and come home uh, for lunch and his wife didn't have lunch ready. It was kind of miffed why I wasn't ready. She said, well, I thought Pastor Buchenhagen was preaching this morning, (laughs) so she wasn't expecting him so soon. So that was that was one of his uh, little foibles that um, Luther and others uh, made uh, made fun of. Uh, But uh, uh, you ask his relationship with others. Uh, He he was close to Melanchthon, um, and uh, when you know after Luther died, uh, and uh, the Reformation fell into disarray. Um, the Schmalkald War was fought and lost. Um, Bugenhagen uh, stayed with Melanchthon, and both of them stayed at the University of uh, Wittenberg to try to keep it going in those very tough times after the loss of the uh, battle. I, I might just mention that even when the uh, victorious troops of the emperor, you know, supporting the Catholic side and suppression of the Reformation occupied Wittenberg, Bugenhagen uh, continued to preach uh, in the city church. He's a very faithful pastor. Others, you know, took off and left, but Bugenhagen uh, stayed there. So he, w- he was close uh, to Melanchthon and um, uh, supported uh, the Reformation uh, with Melanchthon after after Luther's death. Now, he didn't get involved too much in those big conflicts. He didn't write on the stuff that was um, bothering Lutheranism at the time. Uh, he continued just to kind of do his job and to maintain his commitment to uh, true Lutheranism. Um, trying to think if there were any other close associates of his. I'm sure there were, and I'm not remembering anybody. Oh, I, I could mention that he was married. Um, in fact, he was the first of the... Um, Wittenberg uh, theologians to get married. He he got married already in 1522, uh, and Luther didn't marry until three years uh, later. Uh, and his his wife uh, was a was a friend of uh, Catherine von Bora, um, <laughs> and so we sometimes say you know Luther modeled uh, uh, the you know parsonage and parish and wife and family and stuff. Well, it was actually Bugenhagen who did that first because Bugenhagen was the was really the pastor as opposed to uh, Luther, who was his assistant, but mostly a university uh, theologian. So it's my understanding that after Luther died, life was very challenging and difficult for Katrina von Bora. Was was Bugenhagen still able to to serve as pastor to to Katie and her family? Yeah, he was. And you're right. Uh, things were difficult. Oh, there were issues about uh, her support, whether she was going to keep all the property that uh, belonged to her and Luther. And some in the um, 
uh, in the electors uh, court uh, really didn't didn't want her to. They wanted her to kind of live on a modest salary and turn her children over to her boys over to others for education and stuff. Well, Bugenhagen uh, stayed on her side and was her advocate. Uh, and then when financial things got tough for her, uh, Bugenhagen uh, wrote, for example, to the uh, King of Denmark, uh, asking him to um, kind of give a pension uh, to uh, Catherine, uh, as he did. Um, in the throes of the war, the Schmalkald War, at one point, a couple of times, Katie left uh, Wittenberg and uh, Bugenhagen's wife uh, uh, went with her. Um, now, at the very end of her life, uh, Catherine was in Torgau, not in Wittenberg. So I don't think that uh, Bugenhagen would have uh, been her pastor at the very end. Uh, but nonetheless, in those years after Luther's day, he was with her and was uh, one of her advocates. We have just about a minute or two left. Uh, is there anything else that that, uh, that is important for us to know about Bugenhagen, his work, uh, his influence in the Reformation, maybe some things that, that we would recognize today that have his fingerprints on it? Uh, yes, I think there are in terms of the way we're organized, uh, the kind of liturgies that we follow. Uh, all of those things Bugen had a um, uh, hand in uh, shaping. Um, there's one other thing, and I'm not sure how many people in your audience are going to remember this, but for many, many years, uh, Lutherans uh, read a harmony of the Passion narratives uh, during the season of Lent. It was something that was done often in our midweek services. Well, that that harmony actually uh, goes all the way back to Bugenhagen. Uh, Bugenhagen was the one who uh, composed that first uh, harmony of the Passion narratives that was read uh, in our churches for a long, long time. And there, and there still might be some churches that do that. I just know that uh, Church We Belong doesn't do it anymore. But nonetheless, that's one thing that uh, some of uh, our audience might be a little bit familiar with. Fascinating. I love this. <laughs> So much history. Our guest today, Dr. Cameron McKenzie, Professor of Historical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dr. McKenzie, thank you so much for helping us learn about Johannes Bugenhagen today. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Anywhere.